Hi, I'm Rex Black, president of RBCS. Welcome to the RBCS YouTube channel. Hey, I hope you enjoy all these free resources that are available here. And do us one favor. We need to keep the lights on and we need your help to do that. So, when you need testing and quality related services, training, consulting, expert services, you name it, let us be one of the bidders on that next job. We don't expect to get all of your business, but we'd like to get a chance. Thanks and enjoy the shows. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. On behalf of RBCS, welcome to today's webinar on One Key Idea, Code Coverage Demonstrated with GCOV. I am President, I am Rex Black, President of RBCS, a worldwide testing and quality assurance firm serving clients ranging from small startups to Fortune 20 global enterprises. Since 1994, we have delivered insight and confidence to hundreds of clients around the world. Our team of international consultants deliver customized training, consulting, and expert services to companies that are looking to improve their test and quality assurance practices. I am the author of now 14 books on software testing, as well as being the past president of the ISTQB. Um, if you have any questions during the course of the webinar, feel free to submit them at any time via your webinar interface, but please note that they will be answered only at the end. I uh, hope you enjoy this free webinar from RBCS. We do these free webinars as a service to the software testing community because at RBCS we are a not-just-for-profit company. If you enjoy our free webinars and feel they demonstrate solid insights into the kinds of testing challenges you face, please make RBCS your preferred software testing vendor for any and all expert services, consulting, or training. We're happy to provide a quote for any such services you might need. Contact us via email, info at rbcs-us.com. Okay, so today, as I said, we are going to look at code coverage. And we are going to use a particular tool to demonstrate the concept. And that tool is something that you now see here. It's called GCOV. And um, it's a code coverage tool that runs on Linux. Now, if you're not using Linux, there are other types of code coverage tools available in your environment on Mac and on uh, Windows. Uh, and uh, many of those are uh, free tools just like this one. So uh, regardless of the environment that you're working in, with the possible exception of mainframe, you should be able to do something like what I'm about to show you um, for free. Uh, and um, even if you don't need to do this yourself, this is going to be a valuable chunk of information for you in the next 20 minutes or so because this will make you better able to have conversations with your developers about um, about what their unit testing is covering. Okay, And uh, maybe if your developers aren't already using code coverage techniques, you can uh, convince them to do it. All right, so we are going to use this GCOV tool, and we are going to use it specifically to demonstrate code coverage on a uh, program, very simple program that calculates a Fibonacci or creates a Fibonacci series. Um, as I said, it's very simple, very simple piece of code shown here um, on the upper black screen there. This is all, by the way, running on a, a Beagle board, a Beagle board um, piece of hardware um, using Debian Linux, and we have, just in case you care to know, established a connection to it via this Bitvice utility. Where is yeah, Bitvice client? And so you can see that on the, the right-hand side of your screen. Um, and this is all free stuff that comes uh, for uh, available uh, for via download uh, with Debian uh, if you buy one of these Beagle boards. So if you're wondering about a kind of a fun little platform to spend time learning more about coding and code coverage and so forth, I, I recommend these Beagle boards. And for less than $150 total, um, you get this little Linux system on a board uh, with a case and adapter and so forth. So kind of nice. Okay, so anyway, um, 
here we have a very simple program. It's called Fibonacci.C. Um, and remarkably enough, given the name, what it does is produce a Fibonacci series. Um, so let me walk you through the code here and explain the code. And then I'm going to uh, explain the two kinds of coverage that we're going to um, talk about. All right. So whoops. Spotlight. All right, so uh, we have up at the very top what's called a compiler directive, um, and uh, this is this tells the compiler where to go look for some um, information that it needs to compile this code. Basically, this is the only thing in here which is in this in this program which is a a line of code that is non-executable. All the other uh, stuff here is uh, stuff that gets translated into some sort of executable code, basically. Um, normally, you would have comments, other compiler directives, and other kinds of non-executable code or non-executable lines in the program, but I wanted to keep this simple so that we just were looking at the code. So we come in here and it declares some variables, and then it prompts the uh, user to uh, enter the element count. So, how many elements do you want in your Fibonacci series? And if, if you, if you're uh, in an agile world, you're familiar with Fibonacci series from planning poker. Otherwise, you're um, familiar with them from that uh, Tom Hanks movie in the 1990s that involved uh, chasing people all over Europe and ended up in a church in Scotland. Um, so, we enter the uh, the number of elements we want in our Fibonacci series, and if you enter a negative count. See this? And less than zero, it's going to say there is no such series. There's no such series with negative two elements, for example. Otherwise, if you enter a number zero and greater, it prints out an open opening curly brace. It initializes the previous term to zero and uh, the pre-previous term to zero, the previous term to one. Um, and um, it calculates the next term being the sum of these two, and then it starts to print them out. Um, and I will show you that this algorithm actually works. So it's going into a loop, and it's, it's looping around here, and then it prints the closing curly brace and a new line at the end, and then it exits. Okay, so a very simple piece of code. This is a C code. Um, now, we have executable statements, and I'm pointing at those here. And we also have two different kinds of branching statements. Okay, we have an if statement. So if n is less than zero, so in other words, we entered a request for a negative number of terms in our Fibonacci series, it's going to do this branch. This is called the true branch. Otherwise, it does the false branch over here on the else. The other kind of branching that we have in here is a, is a for loop. So the for loop is potentially going to iterate, though it might not. It might never iterate. It might just, this control statement here might evaluate to false the very first time if we enter zero as an input and it skips the body of the loop entirely. If we enter a number that's greater than zero, it's going to um, uh, iterate this, this loop body um, however many times we asked it to iterate. Now, um, you might be more familiar with this kind of thing shown this kind of like code fragments shown as a uh, flow chart so I'm going to show you a very simple flow chart I hand drew this it's ugly I get that sorry this is a free webinar after all what do you want for nothing huh um, all right, so basically in the flow chart here, you can see we have an entry, sorry, wrong pointer here. We have an entry point here, that's the top of the, basically it's the main, and then we have the exit down at the bottom. And then we come in and um, these statements right here correspond to this arrow. And then here we got the loop or excuse me, the, the if statement. And if that evaluates to true, we do this path to the exit, that's this here. And then if it evaluates to false, we go here, 
and we do this, and then we might do the body of the loop some number of times, and then eventually, if we're not in an infinite loop, we exit out. All right, so that's um, that's the code. So now let's uh, see how we can uh, use GCUB to um, test it. Okay, so we'll exit out of the code itself. And what we're going to do is we are going to compile the code. And it gave me a little gripe there about uh, uh, like redeclared exit or something like that, which is my I probably didn't include a compiler directive include that I needed to, but you know it worked. Um, okay, so now let's uh, start off by um, looking at statement coverage. Now statement coverage looks at the executable statements that uh, have and have not been uh, executed as a result of the test. So let's do our first test and see what happens when we um, uh, have a, a negative, we request a negative series. So I'll run the Fibonacci and it's asking me how many elements do I want my Fibonacci series. And let's say I, I enter negative seven here. And it comes back and says no negative seven series and it exits. Okay. So let's look at the code and see what we actually tested. So we run gcov Fibonacci dot C. Okay, and it says that we executed 43.75% of the 16 executable lines. Now, like, okay, well that's not a hundred percent, but what what was it that we didn't didn't touch? So let's take a look at the output. Uh, whoops. Oh. Huh. Hmm. What the heck? Not sure why it's doing that. Ah, there we go. Oh, that's weird. Okay, let's make this a little bigger. And you know what? Let's do it again because that way. Okay, all right. Let me see the whole thing here. Um, oops. Demo effect. All right. So um, what we see here is that uh, the program has been, uh, let me get the, the spotlight going again. Um, the program has been run once. You see that it talks about where the, the source code, the, the graph and the data, this is where the coverage information was tracked by the GCUB tool. Um, and then it says we run the, the, the thing once, it's one program, and it's got dashes indicating stuff that doesn't result in executable code, right? So this got some dashes there. So notice that the main, this line right here, main, has been run once, okay? This has been once, the printf once, the scanf once, the if statement once, this is once, this is once, the else is not executable. These hash signs mean haven't done this, okay? And we haven't done that either. And then we did the exit. Okay. So that's the uh, that's what GCUB is telling us. It's showing us what hasn't been covered. So now we can go back over here. And I can get this over here. Yeah. And let's run a test again. So we're going to run uh, Fibonacci. This time we'll ask for 20 elements. And notice that the way this Fibonacci program is defined, the first element is 1. I know that there are versions of a Fibonacci series that start with zero, but let's just say that one is correct. So there's the 20 element Fibonacci series. So let's again 
look at um, coverage. So we go GCOV. Oops, let me tell you what. Let's just do this. We'll run the GCOV again. And now it says you have now tested 100% of the 16 executable lines. And um, now what we can do is uh, take a look here and what we see, okay, the program has been run twice. You see that? At the top there, it's been run twice. Um, two runs. And main has been run twice. These upper statements have been run twice. The printf in the end gets minus one statements right here. have only been run once since this was true once and false once. And then we, so we came down here. These each got run once. And then we iterated. We did the loop 20 times. And on the 21st time, the, the loop control uh, failed. It was false. So it ex exited here, came here, did the printf. And this has been uh, executed twice as well. So every every statement, every executable statement's been executed at least once, and we know that not only by the 100% counter that it showed us before, but the fact that there weren't any hash signs. Okay, so that's uh, statement coverage. And now we can say, hmm, let's see, what if we're interested in branch coverage? So let's go back over here. And... Um, what we're going to do is we're going to delete the coverage tracking information from the previous tests, which are these guys. Uh -huh. yep. oh. oh, no, wait a minute. That's not right. Uh, no, I don't want to do that one. I want to do this one. All right, this G G GCNO is the instrumentation. You don't want to do that. You want to do the GCDA, which is the uh, cumulative data. Um, okay, so let's now um, repeat the test, and we're gonna we're gonna run the dot the, the Fibonacci program with negative seven, and we're gonna check to see from a branching point of view what that does. So what you do here is you run gcov-b for branch. So show me show me an analysis of branch coverage because by default without that argument it gives you statement coverage. Okay and so what it's telling me here is it gives me the statement coverage 43.75 percent of 16 executable uh, statements run. Uh, branch is executed 50 percent of four. So in other words of the branches that existed, we, we got to half of them. So there's the if branch and there's the for branch. Taken at least once, 25% out of four, which makes sense because we did the if true for negative, and so it skipped that whole else block that had the loop in it, so it never would have looked at the loop. So now what we can do is, um, again, take a look at the... this guy. Okay. You see it says runs one up there at the top and we've got some additional information here. Yeah, get that up. Okay, we got some additional information. Um, we run one, okay, function main called return zero percent blocks executed 50 percent right so there's it's telling us about the block uh, the branch coverage um, that was achieved so it says call returned 100 percent so this uh, this call always returned this call always returned because that's lo looking again at this, this issue of, of uh, function calls as branches and then it says here branch zero taken hundred percent or fall through in other words now branch zero is the true branch which is a little confusing but that's what it's saying is that you did this, and you can see that we have a one and a one there indicating that those lines were executed. This line and that line were executed. And then we have these guys all indicated as pound signs. You see that because we're, we're never 
were never executing. And notice it says branch zero never executed, branch one never executed for the for loop. Okay, meaning we never did the loop. All right, now um, let's go back over here and um, run another test. This time we'll do the 20 again. Okay, and then we'll run the GCOV with the B again. And now notice that it says that we have executed 100% of the branches. And each, now, so by branches here, it means um, the, the if and the, the, the for um, have been reached. And it says taken at least once 100% of for, meaning both the true and the false side have been taken. Um, so again, if we look at the output here, now notice it's uh, Well, that's very odd. Um, as I said, it created that, but it didn't. It obviously didn't. Um, hmm. You notice. You notice what's wrong here is it's saying that it was only run once. You see that it says it's a, it was run once, and these lines were not executed. But it was just telling us that that is not what happened. So. Let's go over here and uh, let's remove the Fibonacci. And let's run the analysis again. Apparently it doesn't like to uh, delete the file. Okay, now it's giving us the correct thing. So let's make sure that it did some, some weird, yeah, okay, so. Well, that's just bizarre. Um, hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is the, uh, the the infamous demo effect rides again here because. Um, I did this yesterday, and this worked just fine. And I know you would, you can sit there and say, "Yeah, well, he would say that," but I did. Um, all right, so we're going to start all over again, including with the compilation. I don't know why that decided to do that to me, other than usual thing of a program deciding that it wants to uh, make you look silly when you're uh, trying to demonstrate it, which of course they always do. All right, so now we're going to run these tests again, and I'm going to hope that it doesn't um, Okay, negative 7. And now if we do the gcub dash b uh, Fibonacci, now you notice we again get that same result. Okay. And if we look at the Fibonacci, there you can see there's stuff that we didn't ever get to. All right, so um, there's that. So let's try it again. Okay. Yep. 
And now it says we got no 100%. And now let's see if it actually worked. Uh -huh. uh, um, oh, there it is. Okay, I wow, that was really strange. I don't know why it was showing the file that was there before, but that's what it was doing. That is a bug in the less utility, I think, because it, it was basically displaying a file that we'd already deleted. Do you notice that? So anyway, here we now see that um, we have the branch. Uh, let me get the highlighter up. Okay, we get the uh, we get the branch. <coughs> the if statement, fifty percent fall through. That's the true branch. One is the is the false, which again is a little bit confusing because we think of those logically the other way around, but that's just the way GCuff does it. And then we get down to the loop, and notice it says branch zero. That's the body of the loop taken ninety five percent of the time, not taken five percent of the time, which would make sense because we told it to count up to twenty. Right. Once it got to 20, it executed. So, the, so there you go. Okay. Now, um, a couple things that I want to point out here, and um, and I'll open it up to questions. Um, first, notice that this that this is a little bit the way that this is calculating branch coverage is purely based on the decision being taken true and false. And so notice that that does not force us to execute the test that results in the, the zero um, executions of the loop, right? Now, some definitions of branch coverage would require you to run this test. And to me, that makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, also, if you're using McCabe's uh, basis path coverage, rule, you would have to run that third test. You couldn't just do it in two tests. Um, now, the other thing that I want to point out here is that code coverage is great, but code coverage by itself is a little bit weak, including on things like an oracle. So, for example, See, if I'd run that test, if I'd run negative 7 and 100, I would say have I would have gotten 100% statement and branch coverage. And I might have just gone, oh, well, it you know, ran. It worked. But then you look at this and you're like, well, wait a minute. The Fibonacci series is supposed to start off with 1 and 2, and then each subsequent element is the sum of the previous two elements, which means it's what's called monotonically increasing. It always goes up. So it should never have actually gone down, but notice that it went negative here. You see that? So the problem is that we don't have what's called a test oracle. Okay, we we're just looking at coverage. We didn't have uh, we didn't have a, a, a good oracle. So it is possible for a developer or or an SDAT to achieve 100% statement of branch coverage, uh, but because of the weakness of their oracle, miss failures that occurred. Uh, during their testing. Okay, so that said, uh, I will uh, open this up for uh, uh, q and A. I'm going to uh, put the uh, advertisement up in the background while we, if I can get, <laughs> if I can get over here. And contact info. Um, before we get into that, I'll uh, just say a quick word about our services. As I mentioned earlier, our team of international consultants deliver customized training, consulting, and expert services to companies looking to improve their test and QA practices. So if you receive valuable information from our free webinars, please help us to continue to provide them by making RBCS your preferred software testing vendor for any and all expert services, consulting, or training. Happy to provide a quote for any such help you might need. Send an email to info at rbcs-us.com. All right, now I um, had an a email um, question that came in um, that said, uh, what's the difference between uh, code coverage and basis uh, test coverage with uh, McCabe cyclomatic complexity? 
And is there a tool that I can use to do cyclomatic complexity uh, analysis as well? So I explained the difference between the two just a moment ago that uh, in cyclomatic complexity, um, it would it, it would basis path testing in cyclomatic complexity, it would force you to, to run that, that Fibonacci series of zero length to test not doing the loop. The way in which the basis paths are constructed forces that. Some approaches to branch uh, test analysis would force that. Uh, some do not. As you can see, GCUF does not force you to do that. Now, in terms of open source tools, um, there there is indeed one. Let's see. We're going to work without a net here. Yeah, I do have it there. Okay. It's called P. McCabe, another open source tool for Linux. So you can download and uh, if I run that against the Fibonacci here, you know, I think I need to have, I think it's dash H is for the header, isn't it? Uh, print column headers. Okay. okay. Okay, yeah, so modified McCabe cyclomatic complexity is three. Traditional McCabe cyclomatic complexity is three. This is 18 statements. There's line, number of lines in the function. Okay, Fibonacci.main. And it would do this if there were multiple uh, lines. Now, it's you notice it says modified versus traditional McCabe. Um, the difference between those is if you have a compound uh, conditional statement that's controlling an if or a for loop or something like that. Um, it counts each one of the atomic uh, conditionals within the compound conditional as an increase in complexity. Um, so uh, that, that can uh, uh, drive a, a larger number of tests. All right, other questions or um, is uh, clear, self-explanatory? You got a twofer here. You got the uh, uh, cyclomatic complexity demo as well. Now you might be thinking, hmm, you know, I, I, this is this is all well and good, but uh, uh, I could use a little bit more information on the sort of the theory behind the these um, uh, coverage levels, statement and coverage, branch coverage, and so forth. And uh, what I'm going to do is uh, post this a after this webinar is done. I will post on our um, uh, LinkedIn and blog and uh, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, on social media, a uh, one of our classic series webinars, which is a full 90-minute explanation of the different code coverage techniques. So uh, you'll um, you'll have that available to you if you want to spend a little more time digging into the theory. The idea of these one key idea things is to you know, in, in 20 to 30 minutes, give you a, an overview and to, to do a demonstration. Okay, so let me just make a note, post, classic, code cov. All right, great. Well, uh, to close this session, do remember that we run these free webinar sessions once a month. Sign up at rbcs-us.com while you're there. Sign up for our regular free newsletter. Uh, that will give you valuable discounts on consulting and training services and our regular uh, newsletter, as I said. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. You can see uh, how to contact uh, me, uh, us, our uh, website, um, the uh, Twitter contact information, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. And do subscribe to the YouTube channel, and uh, our YouTube channel, and uh, pass that along to other people because all of these webinars are recorded and they're posted up there. So if you ever miss one or if you know somebody who, you know, likes this kind of information but has to consume it at sort of off hours, uh, if they're subscribed to the YouTube channel, they'll just get that. Um, the blog is being updated. Uh, so that's rbcs-us.com slash blog. So you can uh, check that out. Um, 
And um, yeah, the LinkedIn is pretty active too. So if you're on LinkedIn, uh, uh, send me a, a connection request and I'll connect with you. Um, we offer these free resources as a service to the software testing community because at RBCS, we are a not just for profit company. Uh, don't forget, we, need, we do need to keep the lights on, so please make RBCS your preferred software testing vendor for any and all expert services, consulting, or training. This concludes the webinar. Thanks to everyone for joining us today, and I look forward to seeing you in May.